Can you see the PowerPoint? Yes, it's, it's right there. So, good morning, everyone. Um, we had a little a, 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 a short uh, communication problem, but we get it solved now. So we are three, three minutes late, but I, I think it will not be a problem. So, welcome, David. Today we have the Dr. David Gopalchuan. Uh, David is a researcher uh, at the University of Nottingham. He has uh, extensive expertise in molecular biology, genomics, and bioinformatics. His research focuses on cadmium mitigation in cocoa, as well as in understanding microbial communities driving cocoa fermentation to improve quality and flavors. Before joining Nottingham, he served as a researcher at the Cocoa Research Center in Trinidad, where he explored genetic uh, diversity within cocoa population. Today, we have a very interesting talk from David uh, entitled Unlocking Cocoa Genetics uh, Potential for Reducing Cadmium in, in Chocolates. David, feel free. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure to have you here with us. And thanks. take your time. Take your time. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, uh, Normando. So, uh, just checking. Um, can you see the slide? Um, and can you hear me properly? Yeah, we, we can hear you for, uh, properly. So, I think you just need to put a, a, a full screen. I think uh, uh, F five. F five. So, is it? Is not showing full screen at the moment. Uh, yes. Um, how about now? Uh, any luck? No, no, not yet. No. Okay, just uh, let me see. Um, share screen. Entire screen. Maybe. Okay, can you see the screen now? Yes, it's the screen now. Okay, great. Uh, okay, uh, so thanks so much, uh, uh, Normando, for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to be joining you all. Um, so I, I work a lot with uh, cocoa and chocolates. Uh, and today I'm going to be talking a bit about some of the work we've been doing around cadmium. Um, so before I get into it, though, uh, just a little bit about my, uh, my research focus. So I do a lot of work uh, with uh, cocoa fermentations. Uh, mainly looking at uh, the microbial communities uh, that drive the fermentation process uh, and um, how it is these communities uh, develop uh, the different flavor profiles that we, we see from different locations, from different farms in different regions of the world. And uh, we use a, a range of techniques uh, from uh, metagenomics uh, to metabolomics uh, uh, we also do metatranscriptomics, uh, um, sensory profiling, quality profile profiling to better understand uh, this entire process and how, how microorganisms uh, fit into the picture. Before um, I, I got into cocoa fermentations, I, I would have done a fair amount of work uh, looking at uh, cocoa populations. Uh, so uh, mainly at looking at the genetic diversity of, uh, of different uh, cocoa varieties. Uh, um, and I would have done this work uh, at the International uh, Cocoa Gene Bank uh, in Trinidad, where I was a postdoc uh, for some time. Now, during this time, too, uh, another focus we had was uh, looking at uh, identifying molecular markers for breeding for different traits. Uh, and it's when I started working on cadmium because it's an it's a, 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 a issue right now for the industry. So... I guess in many ways, uh, um, this story started in, in Japan. In, so in, in 1912, uh, people uh, living in the 
Tomoyama uh, region in, in Japan. So this is uh, a region just downstream of the Jinsu River, right? So in this region, they started experiencing a very strange uh, disease, right? So they were complaining of uh, feeling extreme bone pain, uh, muscle weakness, and then also experiencing uh, renal failure. Now, initially, it was thought that uh, um, this strange disease was caused by a new pathogen, right? So they thought it was a, a, a new microorganism. Um, however, several years later, they realized that uh, uh, this was happening due to uh, chronic uh, cadmium exposure. Now, cadmium, what, what is cadmium? So, so cadmium, it's a, it's a heavy metal that exists naturally in our environment, but usually uh, in small amounts. Um, however, in, in locations where the, the levels of cadmium are high, it can lead to a lot of problems. So, so in, 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 in this region, uh, the, the persons were get feeling this, uh, getting the sickness. Uh, and it turns out that, that upstream of this uh, river, right, so the Jinsu River, upstream of there, I'll see if I can get my laser pointer. Uh, nope. Okay. okay, I think I may have, how do I get back to the slideshow? Um, so, Normando? Okay, so I um, can't seem to get my laser pointer, but uh, it, it's all right, too. Um, okay, so so persons living in, in this region, upstream of that, uh, of, of the river, uh, there were mining activities, uh, and it turns out that uh, uh, a lot of waste that was produced in a mine, uh, had high levels of cadmium, and this was being deposited. It was, it was deposited into the river, and, and the river was taking this uh, high levels of, of cadmium produced from the mines, uh, and it was seeping into the soil and, and, and the waterways uh, downstream of the river into the community. And uh, a lot of the, the farmers would, they would be growing uh, their crops, mainly like rice. Uh, the, the plants would absorb cadmium from the, the water, from the soil, and um, when uh, the, the locals were eating uh, the food, uh, it resulted in the levels of cadmium in their bodies uh, um, accumulating. So our bodies take a very long time to eliminate the cadmium. So over time, uh, the levels of cadmium in the bodies were, incre were increasing, leading to, the, to this disease. So as I mentioned, um, there's uh, the source for, for that case so would have been the mining activities, but there are other sources uh, for cadmium entering in our environment. So for instance, we have uh, on the picture on your on your left, uh, we have uh, weathering of rocks, so cadmium is present in the rocks. Uh, also uh, in, in fertilizers, uh, many fertilizers would have uh, cadmium present. So you apply your fertilizer to your, your soil, to your crop. Uh, you're also applying cadmium. Um, you could get cadmium uh, also from, from car emissions, uh, from different industries, from as uh, pollution, also from, from volcanoes. Uh, so locations where there are volcanoes, the levels of cadmium usually tend to be higher. So the cadmium gets into, into the environment, uh, in the soil, into the water. Now plants, many plants uh, um, can absorb cadmium from the soil, right? So even though cadmium is not uh, an essential element uh, needed by, by the plant uh, for for growing, um, it can be absorbed by the plants. So, and a, a lot of plants uh, can absorb the cadmium. So it is it absorbed from the soil, gets into the roots, and then goes to the shoots, and then to the fruits and beans. Uh, and if it is we eat these plants, uh, it gets into our food chain. And, and by uh, getting into our food chains, uh, we, we tend to, uh, if we can continue eating foods with cadmium, it tends to build up in our bodies because it takes a very long time for our bodies to get rid of this cadmium. And this can lead to a range of different um, uh, diseases. So, uh, 
chocolate. So the main ingredient uh, for producing chocolate uh, is cocoa bean, right? Uh, so cocoa beans are the main ingredients for producing this. And the cocoa beans come from the cacao tree, right? Uh, and the the chocolate, it's, it's a it's a, a, a huge industry. It's uh, in global sales uh, about uh, more than a hundred billion US uh, annually. Um, but besides uh, um, cocoa beans being used to produce chocolate, is used in other industries uh, like uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, nutraceuticals, and also cosmetics. Uh, so uh, cocoa is produced uh, mainly in countries that lie 20 degrees north and 20 degrees south of the equator. So this, this region, uh, we sometimes refer to it as the cocoa belt, right? Because it has the ideal climate for growing the crop. Uh, the largest producer currently is uh, West Africa, producing more than 70% uh, of the world supply of cocoa. However, other important producing regions uh, are Latin America and the Caribbean, as well as Asia and Oceania. Uh, I should mention, um, Unlike many other of the major crops, right? so cocoa is among the top 10 most important uh, agricultural crop, but unlike uh, many of the others, cocoa is mainly produced by small farmers, so small scale farming, um, maybe with an acre or two of land. Right? And we use, it's, it's about more than 5 million small scale farmers uh, across the cocoa belt that's producing the crop. Now, even though cocoa is produced uh, um, across uh, around the world in, this, in the cocoa belt, uh, um, it originally came from uh, South America, mainly the, the, the upper Amazon region. So the upper Amazon region is where you can find uh, uh, different populations of uh, uh, Tiabromo cacao. So Tiabromo cacao is the main species uh, that we use for producing chocolates, uh, right? So... Um, in, and Montemayo in, in 2008 uh, um, showed that uh, cocoa had at least 10 different uh, genetic groups right? uh, and came from mainly the uh, upper Amazon region. Besides uh, uh, Tiabromo cacao that's present uh, from the, the upper Amazon, you also find a range of uh, uh, other members in this family. So we call them the wild relatives. So for instance, there's Tiabromo um, grandiflorum or Tiabroma speciosa. These are these these are relatives uh, of uh, Tiabroma cacao. You want to produce chocolate. Uh. Um, so they so the, fam the family itself it's uh, very diverse and there's all this diversity is present in the upper Amazon region. So I should also mention too that uh, if it is you think about all the cocoa beans produced. Uh, uh, it could be divided into two very broad categories. So in one hand, we have a bulk cocoa, and on the other hand, we have fine and flavor cocoa. And what's the difference between them? The difference is quality and flavor. So bulk cocoa, it's usually of a, a lower quality, um, and the flavor you would you would get from this, so it's we call it a cocoa flavor, so it's a very basic baseline uh, flavor from these beans. So. On the other hand, fine and flavor cocoa is of a much higher quality. And in addition to having this baseline cocoa flavor, you get a range of other flavors uh, from this, right? So imagine you're having a uh, chocolate uh, that's, it, it's, you're tasting chocolate because it, there's that cocoa flavor, but then you get a range of, uh, you're getting other flavors present, like maybe fruitiness or floral or nutty, even though, uh, no additives have been added to your chocolate. It's just the cocoa bean. And, and that's essentially what defines flavor beans. Uh, you, you get a range of other flavors, and it's usually a, a complex mixture of different flavors. And the, the wheel on your on your right, uh, that's uh, the cocoa flavor wheel, right? So um, and you, you could get a range of any combinations of these flavors. So, so beans from, from West Africa are mainly uh, grouped as a bulk cocoa, while beans from, from Latin America and the Caribbean, it's mainly final flavor cocoa, and it, it targets uh, the final flavor market. So there's, uh, so cocoa is uh, among the plants, some of the, the uh, trees uh, that uh, can absorb cadmium, right? So there's many, many plants uh, absorb cadmium, and cocoa is, uh, is one of them. 
absorbs the cadmium from the, the soil and it, it gets into the into the roots and then goes into the to the shoots and then to the beans and then we use the beans uh, to make chocolate so, um so of course this is a, a food safety issue um not only that in in 2019 the eu implemented maximum allowable limits uh, for cadmium in chocolate so um and when it is you look at uh, cocoa beans produced from latin america and the caribbean there are several countries where whereby the beans uh, the levels of cadmium in the beans are uh, a bit above this uh, this limit right so it's uh, the levels of cadmium are uh, elevated so therefore it's a uh, it's uh, a, a issue mainly for for the region so there's been a number of ways uh, the region has been trying to reduce uh, cadmium in the beans right so from looking at uh, soil amendments uh, for instance using lime uh, uh, and then uh, biochar to cultural practices uh, co cropping with uh, hyper accumulators uh, uh, also in the processing the processing to make uh, the chocolates uh, um, these methods have some success uh, you know so for instance the soil amendments uh, can work um, but they're usually fairly costly uh, it's very uh, labor intensive uh, to to be adding these uh, these uh, additives into the soil. It takes a lot of time, and it's not sustainable. And 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 also, it's it really it depends on the types of soil that's uh, it works for some soil and not for others. So, you know, so um, a more sustainable solution is needed. And the approach that we've been looking at is well, could we could we use a genetic approach? Uh, for trying to reduce uh, reduce this cadmium, so 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 that's essentially uh, our, our idea, you know, uh, what what we started working towards. So, so the absorption of of cadmium uh, by plants and movement into the roots and shoots uh, have been studied in a number of species, right? So um, and, and and what essentially we found is. Uh, is uh, a number of, of uh, transport proteins that move cadmium from the soil into the root uh, and then it goes to the shoot and then eventually into seeds so so, so this has this has been well studied in 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 other species now in with regards to to cocoa uh, there was a study done in in 2018 whereby um, they looked at uh, several varieties of cocoa and measured the levels of cadmium uh, what they found was that there were differences in cadmium across these varieties. So they looked at both leaves and beans, and they found that uh, there were differences in the bean, the level of cadmium present in the bean. So up to a 13-fold difference, uh, if they look at the, the lowest, the variety that had the lowest amount of cadmium versus the variety that had the highest amount of cadmium, right? So there was a 13-fold difference in the bean. And then a, a seven-fold difference uh, between the highest and lowest uh, uh, variety for, for, for the leaves. Uh. Also from this study, they did see a, a fairly good correlation be between leaf cadmium and bean cadmium, right? So there were varieties that had low bean, low leaf, those that had high bean and high leaf. Uh. But they did notice that there were some outliers. So there, there was some varieties that had a high, a high bean, uh, but low leaf cadmium, while on the other hand, there were low bean, high leaf cadmium. So based on this, they hypothesized that uh, um, there could be maybe in, in cocoa uh, multiple control points in the movement of cadmium from the soil into the roots, uh, to the shoots, uh, into the beans. So for our work, uh, our hypothesis uh, was that uh, natural genetic variation in cadmium accumulation exists in in cocoa and that this genetic variation can be exploited to develop uh, low cadmium accumulating varieties uh, right so this was our hypothesis uh, and our objective uh, was uh, to identify genetic markers uh, linked to low bean cadmium that can be used uh, by cocoa breeders uh, for rapidly screening populations and fixing this trait now, if it is your cocoa breeder, that's that's a tough life. You know, it's a it's a difficult crop to to, to breed to develop new varieties. 
the disadvantage is um, it has a very long generation uh, time. So from from seed to seed, right? We at least uh, at least three years, but it's closer to five years. So it's three to five years. Um, so very long if it is your breeder. Um, each tree produces a very limited number of seeds, which is another huge disadvantage. Cocoa is also self incompatible, right? So it can't. Uh, uh, pollinate itself, uh, right? And, and it's, it makes it a highly outcrossing species. Uh, and it's, uh, as a result too, it's uh, highly heterozygous. So all these factors combined makes cocoa breeding very difficult. Uh, um, marker assisted breeding, however, can help because uh, if it is you have markers, mainly like genetic markers, you can rapidly screen um, seedlings for a trait that you might be interested in and select. And this could save you, it could save time. Uh, it's more efficient, it could, it's, it's, it could save you a lot of money. And you could quickly well, develop your varieties a lot faster if it is you, you have uh, markers, genetic markers. So. so our idea was to, to first look at the cocoa varieties and try to identify uh, differences across uh, across them to see if there was. So to do this, we went to the International Cocoa Gene Bank in Trinidad. Now, the, 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 the gene bank, essentially, it's a collection of uh, cocoa germplasm, right? So we have more than 2,000 different varieties of cocoa that's present in this collection. Um, the site is more than 100 acres uh, um, for each each variety had up to 16 trees and it's planted in, in, in plots uh, and the trees are propagated via rooted cuttings. So, so a lot of the varieties in the gene bank, but there, there's a lot of uh, primary germplasm, right? So primary germplasm, and these would have been collected uh, through several expeditions into the Amazon. This happened about a hundred years or almost a hundred years ago. Ex expeditions into the Amazon collecting material from the wild, right? Uh, uh, and uh, were, were brought back uh, to Trinidad. So we had primary geomplasm. Uh, in addition to the, the primary geomplasm, right, from the different cocoa populations, uh, um, there's also a lot of uh, hybrid varieties. Uh, so, for instance, um, the varieties that would have been developed uh, in different countries through, through farmers selection over time uh, from different countries in, in South America, from Central America, uh, Caribbean, and other parts of the world. Uh, all, all these different hybrid varieties uh, were uh, uh, present in the collection. There's also the, the infamous uh, ICS uh, uh, varieties, and these were varieties that were developed uh, in Trinidad uh, between uh, 19, 1930 to 1940-ish. You know, and, and these are very famous hybrids, uh, uh, varieties that are uh, still used today in many uh, cocoa farms around the world, right? So, so the, the collection essentially is very diverse uh, uh, when it comes to cocoa, a lot of different genetic backgrounds, which is what you need when it is you want to screen. And also the collection has, uh, uh, the site has moderate levels of cadmium, which facilitated the screening for differences in cadmium uptake. Yeah? So we we collected um, leaves and beans for more than 500 varieties uh, from this collection, and we tried to sample from and capture as much diversity as we can from the different cocoa populations. So, so the, the, the wheel, the bottom shows you the different uh, populations that we would have collected. Um, um, and then we also collected, so these samples would have been collected for to analyze the levels of cadmium. And then we also collected leaf samples uh, to, to do DNA sequencing. Uh, of these varieties. So the, the leaves and beans, uh, well, we separated the beans into the tester and cotyledons, uh, and then uh, we'd have dried the samples uh, and, and digested with acid and then analyzed using ICPMS. Uh, and for the DNA samples, uh, we isolated the DNA and did uh, DNA sequencing on them. Now, what we saw was uh, so what you're seeing here is the, the results from the ICPMS analysis, uh, right? So uh, going across, uh, right? So from left to right, uh, we have, uh, so we have the first uh, heat map is, is uh, the, the element, uh, elemental analysis from the leaf. Uh, then we have the cotyledon and then the tester. And, and also across it, each um, 
uh, each element. So, right, so we have elements going across and then coming down, we have the different varieties. And what we saw was that uh, there were massive differences uh, in the elemental profile across varieties. Uh, and in particular, for the cadmium, we did detect uh, there were some varieties that had very high levels of cadmium and those with very low levels of cadmium, right? So this, this we saw this variation, natural variation existing. And we, we saw this with both leaf, uh, cotyledon, and tester. So when we looked at the, focusing on the, the, the cadmium, right? So we, we at the leaf, uh, there were a huge difference uh, between the highest and, and lowest, so about a, about a tenfold difference. Uh, uh, the levels of cadmium, and also we saw these differences in, in the bean as well. We also saw differences uh, in the fractions. So uh, the levels of cadmium was highest uh, in the leaf, uh, then followed by the cotyledon and was lowest in the tester. We did see uh, a good strong correlation uh, in leaf cadmium and cotyledon cadmium, so the bean cadmium, um, which, was, which was good because it meant that we can use leaf cadmium as a proxy for measuring uh, bean cadmium. So in addition to looking at the, the levels of cadmium in, in the different cocoa varieties, uh, we have uh, the elemental profile for a bunch of other elements, right? because we would have measured 23 elements uh, with this analysis. Uh, and we did see uh, some good correlations. For instance, there's uh, uh, potassium and uh, we have rubidium and then calcium and strontium. So these usually are correlated well together because they are uh, chemical analogs. Uh, but essentially, we we were able to generate a massive data set, uh, uh, elemental profile for um, the leaves, uh, leaf, uh, cotyledon, and tester for more than 500 varieties of cocoa, which is uh, a valuable uh, information. So with regards to DNA sequencing, we sequenced uh, the uh, 500 accessions. Uh, we generated uh, uh, about 7 billion reads. Uh, and the average coverage uh, was about uh, uh, 3.9x. Uh, right? So we, we did uh, low coverage uh, sequencing for this analysis. Uh, um, these, the reads were then mapped to the, the Criollo genome. Right, and most of the reads mapped, we were able to identify more than 18 million SNPs. Um, and after filtering, though, we had about 2.7 million SNPs, uh, which is still a lot of, of markers we can use. So, so the type of analysis we, we wanted to do to, to, to get to the point of trying to identify molecular markers, right? So the first thing we needed to do was link genes to cadmium, right? So we, we, we needed to make this connection. And to, to do that, uh, we, the approach was uh, to use a genome-wide association analysis, uh, which, which is a, a very powerful tool uh, to try to identify candidate genes. So, so this was uh, the analysis that we chose. Um, with this method, we used uh, the genotype likelihood uh, uh, approach. And we did identify a structure in the, in the uh, you know, 500 samples, which we expected because we covered the different genetic groups. Uh, and we did correct uh, in the analysis, we did correct for the structure. We did also uh, uh, correct uh, for uh, the distribution for the cadmium as well. So we did the boxcock uh, uh, correction. So having done that, uh, the next step was, was uh, to uh, test our, our or genotype data pipeline, so the GWAS pipeline, right? So we that's what we wanted to do to make sure that this is actually might be working. So to, to do that, to, we selected pod color as our control, right? So pod color, it's if it's red, anthocyanin is present. Uh, if it's green, anthocyanin is absent. So very very basic phenotype. So we took uh, this, the phenotypic data connected it with the, geno the genotypes uh, for the 500 varieties, uh, and then did the GWAS. So. And what we saw was that uh, there was a massive uh, pileup of SNPs uh, over chromosome 4, right? So in fact, it was uh, over this uh, MIB113 uh, transcription factor. Now, in a previous study done by Mottemeyer, um, he showed that part Pod color was controlled by this uh, MIB transcription factor. So, when it is we got this result where 
we got a, a very strong, convincing QTL indicating that this gene controlled pod color. This was good news because it indicated that our pipeline was working. Now, what, uh, what was even better was when it is we compared our results to, to the findings of uh, Mottemeyer before, he was able to, to resolve pod color to a very broad uh, QTL uh, peak, right? So it had about uh, one megabase pair uh, across the genome. Whereas uh, when it is we did our analysis, our peak of SNPs uh, was uh, 0.1 megabase pair. So it meant that our pipeline, our GWAS pipeline, had a much higher resolution in uh, then linking the, the genes, uh, well, the SNPs uh, to the, the gene that's actually controlling the trait, uh, which was uh, an added benefit. So having the, the genetic data and then having the cadmium data, we did the analysis. And, and what we got uh, was uh, the, these Manhattan plots uh, from for the leaf, uh, cotyledon, and tester. And what we saw was that there were a number of uh, um, SNPs, a number of QTLs that came up uh, as being responsible for controlling the, the cadmium trait. Uh, now, the thing about uh, uh, doing a GWAS is you do tend to get uh, uh, a fair amount of uh, false, uh, false positives. Uh, so having generated this information, the next step we had to do was uh, uh, try to validate uh, some of these. Uh, so we selected the top, uh, the top nine uh, QTLs, uh, and this selection was based on the the uh, largest effect size, uh, as well as those what the SNPs that had the highest significance. So we selected the top nine QTLs, uh, right? Right, and then afterwards, uh, we then selected parents, uh, so uh, cocoa varieties that were either heterozygous or homozygous. Uh, at uh, the particular uh, at the particular QTL, right? So we selected these parents, either heterozygous and homozygous, and then we did a, a series of different uh, biparental crosses with them. So to do the biparental crosses uh, uh, with the parents, uh, uh, we'd have done a fair amount of pollinations between them. Uh, then when they, they de uh, developed fruits, uh, we took the seed, these seeds, grew them up into seedlings, uh, and then transplanted them into uh, soil contaminated with cadmium. We let them grow for a while and then harvested the leaves uh, and then analyzed uh, the leaves uh, with the ICPMS. So this is the result from, uh, um, from the seedlings, right? So we've analyzed uh, so far about 750 seedlings. Uh, and um, the results are actually quite uh, Quite interesting, you know. So, first of all, we what we saw from the result were there were massive differences uh, in cadmium uh, within varieties, uh, well, within the cross and between crosses, uh, right? Uh, so, so for instance, uh, there was some some, uh, some crosses that gave uh, when you cross the parents, uh, you cross a uh, high and low, you get extremely low levels uh, of cadmium being present uh, in the F ones, uh, right? On on the other hand, other times when you cross uh, uh, high and low, you would get very high levels of cadmium being present. Uh, um, and then the, the, the other, what we also saw was that you, some crosses, you cross low and high, you would get a range. So some being very high, some being very low, and others in between. So a lot of variation was we detected, indicating that there is clear signs of a, a strong genetic effect in the controlling the cadmium trait. Now, it's very exciting results. Uh, um, uh, we still have uh, some more F1s that we are currently analyzing, but uh, what we are seeing is that uh, it, it, the results are telling us uh, that uh, it's more than likely uh, the cadmium trait in cocoa is controlled by more than one uh, major uh, QTL, right? And it's likely that there is uh, interaction effect uh, between them. So, so this is... Uh, how it is we would have gone about to, to validate uh, the QTLs that we identified. And uh, the results are very encouraging, indicating that we are on that QTLs that we identify um, may be actually controlling the, the cadmium in cocoa. Now, to, we are currently doing additional uh, uh, linkage analysis uh, to further verify this. Uh, we're also looking at to doing fine mapping to 
identify the genes. We do. Uh, we are planning to sequence uh, the genomes uh, for the parents and the F ones uh, to identify exactly where the mutations are, and we want to follow up this, this work with uh, some functional studies uh, to understand the mechanism of how it is uh, these genes might be controlling the cadmium in cocoa. But essentially, uh, this is a very exciting result so, because it indicates. It indicates that we are on to identifying the QTLs that controls the cadmium. So with that, um, and from the study, we were able to, to develop this, this GWAS pipeline, right? So uh, two, almost three million SNPs in this pipeline. Um, we've been developing this pipeline so that it can be flexible. So we used it for for looking, identifying genes, uh, kind of genes that control cadmium, but potentially this can be used uh, for looking at other traits. Uh. So we've been uh, building the pipeline to, to do just that. Uh, so in this pipeline, uh, if it is you have uh, uh, phenotypic data uh, for these varieties, uh, then you can enter it uh, into the into the into the analysis, and then it it give you. Um, Hits uh, so the, the the QTLs, the location of QTLs, and the potential genes uh, within this area of the QTL. So we've been developing the pipeline to to do just that, uh, and to work with a range of traits. Uh, so not only just working with with cadmium, but for for any other trait. Uh, uh, if it is you are uh, interested in some other phenotype, uh, right? And and this is something that we see as being uh, a tool that. So right now it's uh, it's present present in the servers at, at Nottingham. But, but this is something that we see as, uh, as a tool that can be used by the community, the cocoa community. For for instance, uh, their research is looking at a range of other, other phenotypes uh, from disease uh, resistance uh, to productivity, to uh, uh, drought uh, tolerance, to other stresses. Uh, um, and potentially it can be, it's a very, powerful tool that can be used uh, for mink, making that link between genes uh, and traits uh, to ultimately develop uh, markers for breeders. Uh, so we've used uh, this pipeline now, right? So I I, I, I call it the Kagwa pipeline, right? Uh, um, and we've, uh, of course, we had the phenotypic data for the, the, the other elements uh, that we have analyzed with the ICPMS. Uh, so for instance, we have the Manhattan plots here. Uh, we, we got, uh, uh, hits uh, for zinc, uh, we have arsenic, uh, manganese, uh, uh, phosphate, sulfur, uh, calcium, and th these are just some, right? So potential uh, of uh, uh, these are QTLs, uh, potential genes there at these locations that might be controlling these other elements. Uh, now, currently, we don't have any, uh, at least we don't have any plans to follow up on these other elements. Um, but essentially, it's it's uh, we're willing to uh, if there's uh, anyone in the community uh, who is uh, this is something that you're interested in or you're currently working on. I mean, this this is something that we're willing uh, to collaborate and we could share uh, this information. If it is you're interested in following up in an element and doing additional work, we could uh, we are willing to 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 share this information uh, with you. So and and in addition to uh, doing like elemental profiles, uh, we've uh, uh, we've done use the pipeline now for other traits. Uh, so and like for instance in fruit development and productivity, and have gotten some strong QTLs from that, which uh, uh, some PhD students are, are currently following up on. So essentially, um, if it is uh, if it is you you're interested uh, in in maybe um collaborating or, or uh, with us uh, on, on any of these topics you know uh, we do do a lot of work with the cook research center and uh, professor uma he's the director for the center um so the center besides doing a lot of work with cadmium they also uh, do a lot of work with uh, uh morphology in cocoa and pathology genetics uh, uh, uh fermentations and, and quality and chocolate making uh, if it is you're interested in 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 doing some work in that in that space, you know you could you could contact him. You know he's uh, uh, totally open for collaborations. He's also the well the Cocoa Center is uh, 
is also the, the caretakers for the International Cocoa Gene Bank. So, for instance, if it is your, you're interested in a, a trait uh, and, and you think uh, it would be useful you know, uh, for, or, um, uh, for you to, to go to the gene bank uh, and uh, phenotype uh, that, uh, that trait across the varieties that uh, we would have sequenced, uh, um, feel free to contact him. You know, he's totally open for collaborations. Um, so in addition to, to uh, Uma, there's also, I work closely with uh, Gabriel. So Gabriel from Nottingham, he, I, I do a lot of work with him with regards to the fermentation side. Um, so Gabriel, he, is, uh, he does a lot of work with looking at uh, microbial communities, mainly at micro plant interactions. Uh, uh, and he does a lot of uh, really cool stuff uh, using uh, techniques like uh, uh, metagenomics, metatranscriptomics, uh, um, mutant analysis, uh, uh, genetics, uh, genetic approaches to to better understand this relationship. Uh, you know, so he's also quite open to uh, to collaborations. But essentially, what I'm saying is that if if it is you you see the potential for for collaborating or even writing projects. Uh, um, with uh, with maybe the Cook Research Center in Trinidad or with the University of Nottingham, uh, feel free to contact us. Uh, um, we're totally open uh, to this because uh, um, we, we, we understand the importance of building partnerships uh, and, and trying to, to develop the science. Uh, and, and like for Coco, I'm really interested in is developing the crop. Uh, um, so with that, uh, you know, I would like to say uh, for the cadmium project, uh, we've had uh, uh, a team of people at both at the Cocoa Research Center, uh, as well as the University of Nottingham, who's been working on this project from, from the, the uh, plant breeders uh, to the, the biochemists, uh, the analytical chemists, the bioinformaticians. It's, you know, all have contributed greatly to developing uh, the research so far. Also, uh, we're, we're quite grateful to, to Mars, who has been very supportive of this project. Uh, scientists as Mars as well. They're, also have, have helped a lot uh, in bringing this project forward. And we're also quite grateful to the uh, European Union, the EP EPPN funding for helping us uh, phenotype uh, the different uh, cocoa varieties. Uh, so um, with that, uh, I'm open to any questions, uh, um, if you have any. Thanks. Uh. David, uh, thank you very much David, for a really amazing presentation. I know that you, you have loads of data and sometimes in a really short time to show everything is quite little, isn't it? There's a lot of years that you have been working on it. So yeah, it's just, just, just so people understand firstly um, about the, the how, how exactly is precise what you have, you have been, you have been conducting? So how how long did you spend in Trinidad working uh, with Cocoa, and afterwards, how long you have been in Nottingham and doing this partnership between Nottingham and other institutions? Yeah, so, so I, I first started um, working in Cocoa uh, as a postdoc uh, at the, the center in Trinidad, um, and is is during that time when um, looking at the, the cocoa populations, uh, um, we became really interested in the cadmium work. Uh, um, so I would have done like uh, initially, we started this work in, in 2018, actually, you know, collecting, uh, uh, collecting samples across, uh, across the gene bank. Uh, it, was, it was a lot of work. Uh, you know? So myself, uh, uh, Caleb, uh, who was a PhD student at the time, uh, uh, so we'd have spent a lot of time uh, in the gene bank, uh, collecting leaves, uh, collecting fruits. And, and because cocoa, uh, it, it, it bears fruit twice for the year, right? You know, so you have to wait for the fruiting season. And then when it produces the fruit, you, you have to harvest it at a particular stage. Uh, and then you're, 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 it's, cocoa grows a bit, uh, it's, it's par partial forest, uh, partial a cultivated land so you're dealing with uh, the environment you're dealing with animals uh, um, so we, we collected we'd have cl spent a fair amount of time collecting samples uh, and then we had to process the samples uh, so um, drying the samples grinding the samples so 
it's, it's very tedious grinding using mortar and pestle so basically um and then um and then analyzing with the 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 icpms so at that point when we collected the samples is when i came to to nottingham right so i came here with uh, uh with through the future food beacon which is a, a food institute that was uh, established at the university to look at uh, different crops uh, and uh, the director uh, at the time uh, david salt uh, his background um, is in uh looking at the ionomics right and he would have done a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of the important finding when it comes to to cadmium and other elements uh, you would have done some major breakthroughs. so he top uh, researcher in the world for for, for this uh, so came here uh, i came to nottingham and worked with him doing this analysis and then because the university also has its uh, sequencing facility uh, facilitated the sequencing of the the varieties. So we isolated the DNA, and I came got training on how to to sequence to do the DNA sequencing. Got it sequenced, uh, and of course, there's a team of uh, bioinformaticians uh, who would have uh, uh, helped us uh, along with this project. You know, so um, it's it's been a journey. You know, it's been it's been a a, a real journey. Um, the collaboration between the, the center in Trinidad and the University of Nottingham, you know, uh, made this possible because, because essentially it was uh, using the strengths of both institutions. So the center had the diversity and the experience with COCO. The university had uh, the a lot of the the technologies, uh, uh, latest uh, uh, technologies uh, for sequencing, latest for for elemental analysis, uh, and the 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 people who are also quite trained in 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 in, in, in doing these types of analyses you know? so it came together and actually was able to uh, accomplish our goals uh, you no know, our findings uh, with these uh, so when we did the, the GWAS, uh, essentially with this analysis you you do a GWAS, you get uh, uh potentially is candidates uh, candidate to genes or candidate snips might be linked to your trait uh, but then you do need to do validation work uh, to kind of uh, um to confirm this because if it is you are a, a plant breeder uh and you uh, if i was to go to a plant breeder and give him a molecular marker and say oh this marker controls uh, this trait uh and he starts using this remember this is he's he's gonna he spends years to develop for just one cycle it's years of time he's going to be spending on this and if it is he, he uses a, a marker that's not really very good uh, for for the trait uh, then essentially he's wasting a lot of time so, so that is why it's so important uh, um, for validating these markers, uh, uh, spending time validating the markers, because essentially that, that's where it has to get to, right? It has to get to the plant breeder. Here are the ones who actually is going to use it. Uh, so, and, and we, we have to be confident that when it is we give the plant breeder this marker, he knows that uh, he uses this marker, it's actually going to uh, lead to a change in the, in the population and, and he could track the phenotype as he's breeding. So, so that is why we spent this time also in, 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 in validating the work, and and also uh, quite grateful to Mars, the team at Mars, so the scientists at Mars, who is also uh, encouraging uh, this, uh, uh, and, and because it's also quite important for them as well and for their breeders. Uh, you know, so, so yeah, so um, it's it's been essentially it's been a journey, you know, but um, we're we're quite happy that uh, where we've gotten so far, and potentially you know we we could take it even further. Nice. Uh, David, we have a, a few questions from the, the audience. This is from Hayane Oliveira. She asks, what are the health risks associated with uh, excessive consumption of carbon in food such as chocolate? Right. Yeah. So so, so, so that's it, right? It's, uh, it's, it's a, a range of foods uh, that uh, can accumulate carbon. So from, from cereals, uh, uh so like for instance uh, rice uh, uh it's it's what it tends to accumulate a lot of cadmium wheat uh, accumulates a lot of cadmium um and then cocoa as well can absorb cadmium so it's in, in the food chain uh, there are many sources uh, it, it can get into our food supply right and and, and, and even like uh animals animals eat uh, the plants uh, they could accumulate the cadmium as well and we eat animals uh, you know so there's 
a lot of ways we can get uh, uh, cadmium uh, into our food supply, including chocolates. Uh. Um, so the problems with this is uh, it leads to a range of diseases. Um, uh, from uh, one of the most, uh, I think, um, the ones that uh, you would you would hear often is it leads to to the brittleness of the bones, uh, the soft bones. Uh, um, patients who who experience this. Uh, um, you know, they, they, these fractures very easily. Now, mind you, it, it, it's so it's very rare to have acute poisoning of cadmium. And what do I mean by that? You, you, you have something. It has so level, so much cadmium in there. You're going to experience the effect immediately. That's that's acute poisoning of cadmium. That's very rare. More than likely, is what happens is uh, you have. Uh, um, gradual accumulation of cadmium in your bodies right so so let just just to make that distinction so it's uh, it's that uh, the foods uh, many foods have cadmium right uh, and even though it might be in small amounts uh, uh, because it takes at least 10 years uh, to reduce the levels of cadmium by your body by 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 about half right so 10 to 30 years so, so you 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 you're consuming food it has small amounts of cadmium it's taking a very long time for your body to get rid of it. The levels are building up and it's building up and building up. And over time, we're talking over a period of time, there is really where the, the these we start seeing these problems. So uh, problem with your bones, uh, uh, also um, renal problems or so problems with the kidneys, uh, uh, leads to uh, cancer and a range of other types of ailments. So, so, so th and, and it is something that we've... Uh, we we are aware of right, especially with the extreme case that would have happened in the in the earlier days, uh, um, and a, a lot of the food agencies uh, um, have been uh, setting, essentially regulating cadmium right. So across the food chain, so it's not only uh, uh, cocoa, chocolates, uh, uh, but in in other foods as well. It's the industry. Uh, uh, government regulators are setting these limits uh, for cadmium in foods uh, that uh, uh, would unlikely lead to these uh, uh, to these negative effects uh, you know so uh, and as and as a result uh, the industry um, also has to respond as well you know because it's it's consumers uh, so of course the industry uh, it's very important to the industry uh, and and also to to comply with the regulators uh, um, Latin America, Caribbean, the soil is uh, 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 volcanic. A lot of it is volcanic in nature, um, and 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 that is how you get uh, the, the the levels of cadmium a bit elevated in in some of these countries. Uh, you know, um, and 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 yeah, I I think uh, so. I, currently, we uh, the uh, governments, uh, farmers are using um, these sort of control measures like the biochar colleague of mine's postdoc uh, at uh, the Coco Center in Trinidad. He, he does a lot of work with this, uh, Gideon, does a lot of work with looking at um, these soil additives and and, and it, 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 it works, you know, and it, it's at least for now, it's a, a temporary measure um, for reducing the cadmium, but it's uh, it's very expensive. Huh? Um, it's, uh, it's very labor intensive because you have to apply, to apply them to the soil. Uh, it takes a, is a lot of time, um, but what we are looking at in the future is uh, developing varieties uh, that would have uh, low levels of cadmium present. Uh, you know, so in addition to having other desirable traits like good yields, disease resistance, uh, good flavor uh, characteristics, we also want to include in in our varieties uh, reduce cadmium uptake because cadmium is not needed by the plant uh, you know so so that's that's what we see as the genetic approach uh, having the the markers uh, that breeders can use uh, to start incorporating this trait uh, into their new varieties uh, for the future very nice david we have one more from ayo brasileiro she asks what is the economic and environmental importance of reducing cadmium levels in cocoa. Right. Uh, so, um, but it, in terms of the economics, uh, it's uh, it's very, very important. Uh, um, so this directly affects the cocoa farmers 
in, in Latin America, in the Caribbean. Um, so for instance, uh, um, with the implementation, implementation from the, the EU, um, with the, the limits uh, um, for, for cadmium in cocoa, in, in a way, even though I don't want to, I mean, I don't want to get political, but in a way it adds, it comes like a trade barrier. So, so now it's for countries, it's uh, you no longer, you lose your market essentially, right? Uh, so if it is your, and, and the largest uh, uh, chocolate market really is Europeans, right? Uh, so the US, uh, but also Europe eat massive amounts of chocolate. So essentially, if it is you're a, a, a farmer in, in in South America and you, you're, you've been supplying your beans and then your beans to a company in, in Europe, uh, with this uh, with the regulations, if you have elevated levels of cadmium in your beans, you essentially lose your market. So that directly impacts the farmer. And and and, and, and the cocoa farmers, these, these guys are, I mean, most of them, these are very, very small farmers, right? Uh, just uh, maybe an acre or so of land. Uh, you know, they, these are not massive estates. It's usually small guys who are just getting by, you know, and this directly impacts them, you know, because they live uh, pretty much from crop to crop, you know. Uh, so, and then also for the for countries, uh, loss in exports, uh, loss in markets, uh, you know, so it's uh, economically, it's massive, uh, for for the region, for Latin America, and Ukraine, it, it's quite a, quite important. For the chocolate on the chocolate producer side, it's also important, especially well mainly for the fine flavor producers. So I mentioned that we have bulk cocoa, fine and flavor cocoa. So the, the bulk cocoa is what you get. Uh, you go to the supermarket, you 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 your regular chocolate bar. Right, that's usually uh, the bulk cocoa, and 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 those beans are coming from from West Africa. Um, West Africa, um, fortunately, don't have a, a cadmium problem. You know, so the levels of cadmium in the beans are are fine. Um, whereas the, the problem is really main, mainly with uh, South America, uh, some Caribbean countries. So, um, so 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 for the the for regular chocolate. Uh, it's 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 not too much an issue, um, and 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 so what the, the industry has been doing is uh, they've been blending, right? So if it is they imported uh, a batch, or if if a batch of beans a bit on the elevated side for the cadmium, they would mix it with another batch that has lower amounts, uh, right? So you get this blend, um, which can work for for the bulk market, but if it is your final flavor where you specialize in in producing a uh, uh, chocolate uh, that came from beans from a particular region in, in I don't know in Ecuador or Colombia or or, or Peru uh, that's your market uh, so you don't really blend and and these are really for the fine flavor market uh, so it, it directly impacts uh, the fine flavor market because it's it's a difficult now to to sign, to try to reduce the cadmium at that stage processing stage. Uh, so, so that's the economic side of it. Uh, the environmental importance, it, so it has a major impact uh, for um, uh, uh, the wildlife, uh, uh, for plants, uh, so reduce growth, reduce yields, uh, affects our crops, just general environment. Uh, uh, animal life, it affects them. If the levels are excessive, can lead to, uh, to, to death uh, for, for, for these uh, for, for the wildlife as well. So uh, the environmental impact is also a major impact, uh, you know, so the, the cadmium problem, it, it, and, and that is why so much attention uh, has been placed on this. Uh, it's, uh, and for the industry, the cocoa industry as a whole, it's, it's one of the major challenges that faces the industry right now, you know, and, and that is why so much uh, research is being done in this space. Nice. Uh now I have a, a question from Michelle Santos. Can different varieties ab absorb different different varieties absorb different amounts of cadmium in different parts of the plant? Yeah, yeah. So, 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 th so that is what essentially what what we found, right? Uh, was that uh, not only varieties can absorb there are differences in in uh, the amount of cadmium varieties can absorb, right? So there's a genetic uh, effect. So some varieties absorb very little, some varieties absorb 
a lot. And then there, in addition to that, even within uh, for, for within varieties, you can get some varieties absorb a lot more cadmium in the leaves versus the beans, while in other varieties, you got a lot more in the beans versus the leaves. So you do get this variation. And um, what I had mentioned was uh, there's a range of uh, different control points, uh, right? And essentially, these are transporters. These are uh, pumps or channels that are present in the cells that can move the cadmium across uh, membranes uh, and, and move the cadmium from the soil into the roots, uh, into the shoots, and into beans. Uh. And so, uh, and, 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 that, and that's the cool thing about uh, uh, nature and genetics is that, uh, uh, and when it is you screen a, a large population, a natural popula a population like what we would have screened, we'd have picked up uh, one of likely different mechanisms that were present. So the population that we screened uh, at the gene bank, uh, it covers uh, the main groups of cocoa that would have uh, evolved uh, um, and developed over time. You know, so there's a lot of alleles, uh, different versions of the gene that are present that function slightly differently that we are picking up. Uh, you know, so it's, it's quite exciting, uh, quite exciting stuff that uh, we are actually seeing how it is uh, uh, genes and genetics uh, can be controlling uh, a trait like, like the cadmium. You know, so, and this is what we plan to exploit, uh, especially for, for, for what we've seen is that you can develop a, um, from the crosses, what we've done, develop varieties that just produce very little, very low levels of cadmium. You know? So it, it, it's showing that using this, this approach is quite feasible. Um, and and, and that, that's why it's so exciting. Yeah. Um, I, I will make my comments a little later because I have one more question from Antonio Antonio, Antonio asks, uh, could the presence of uh, most cadmium uh, in the leaves be linked to the photosynthesis process carried out by the leaf? Um, yeah, um, a good question. Um, could it be? I mean, off, off hand, I, I would say I, 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 I don't think it might be because, uh, because cadmium is not. Uh, it's not a, an essential element uh, needed for the growth uh, or functioning in the plant, uh, right? So usually it's uh, it piggybacks of other transporters that are present, uh, you know. So a plant does fine without cadmium; doesn't need it in any way, you know. So it, it's it's not really essential for any essential processes in the plant, uh, you know. So. So, so yeah, I, I, I would say, I, I think, uh, I think not. Uh. Yeah. Uh, maybe, uh, uh, David. Uh, I always when I think about, I, 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 work, I did my my PhD work on fermentation using different type of um, minerals in the the wood. So exactly when you think about nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, copper, zinc, manganese and iron, yeah, they, they have a lot of specific rules in, in, inside the, the all micro, uh, uh, all uh, organisms and microorganisms. Yeah. So when you, I always when I think about, I, I, I got this this question from from Professor uh, Chris Bottom, he specialized in, in, in fermentation, and he asked me, why you didn't start about the cadmium? So it's exactly, when you try to find in the, the, the pathways what the, the rule don't have. So, but this is interesting because it depends the level that they are in there, maybe it makes the, 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 the that, that microorganism weak. So it could be about the one yeast, could be a bacteria, could be a, a plant. Yeah, so it's exactly, it's, a, it's really, we can just classify this really just bad stuff. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, so so it, there are work uh, I know being done by some researchers as well, looking at uh, could we use microorganisms to control the cadmium too, right? Uh, you know, so um, it, there's some work done by some groups. Uh, um, I know in the US uh, they're working on that. Uh, um, so and and in addition to that, uh, I mean, I can add to it is that uh, we would have looked at uh, the fermentation effect uh, on on cadmium levels in the beans. Uh, 
And so what we did see was as uh, the beans ferment, the levels of cadmium reduced, uh, went down in the beans. Uh, um, and But there was also it, it, how it varied uh, depending on varieties. So some varieties it reduced a lot and other varieties less. Uh, you know, so there was also a genetic effect in as you ferment the beans, uh, uh, this reduction in cadmium, which is it's quite crazy. I know it's, 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 it's complex, but also very interesting. Ah, we have uh, Everton Barbosa. He tried try to translate, but he asked, he, he did, uh, he made the question in Portuguese. How the industry of chocolate uh, reacts, reacted to the research in what the expectations for adoption of cacao, uh, uh, cocoa, low cadmium? Make sense? Did it make sense I, for you? Uh, I'm, the, I'm the, not sure. The general, I, 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 ideas, the, the general idea is how, uh, if, if you got any 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 reaction from the industry um, during your research, and how what they, are the are uh, their expectations for getting more uh, cacao with low levels of cadmium? Right. Um, for the industry, it's extremely important. Right, uh, um, it's one of their top priorities uh, right now. Um, I know that, uh, especially uh, industries that are looking to uh, start uh, developing um, uh, their plantations uh, in South America. Right, so so there is, uh, it's 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 predicted that uh, with climate, uh, changing climate, uh, um, the output from West Africa uh, is going to change as well. Um, maybe not for the better. Um, and, and also there is the, the concern that uh, the current practices um, are not very sustainable because it's usually slash and burn. Uh, so, so there is there, there are these factors. So, so what the industry has been looking at is, well, we, we need supply of beans, essentially, right? So they need beans. Yeah? So they've been looking at other regions of the world to, 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 to do this. So, uh, I know work done on the Asia as well. There's work going on there. But there's also work being done in South America, right? So in the past, uh, actually not too long ago, uh, most of cocoa was produced uh, from South America, right? So South America was the major supplier. Uh, but then uh, there was this disease, a frosty pod, uh, devastated the industry, right? Uh, so it's a terrible disease. Uh, um, opportunity That created opportunity uh, for West Africa, you know, so they became quite uh, dominant in, in producing the supply. Um, there is, I mean, it's, I, I'm not sure, but there is signs that maybe there's shift again in this uh, dynamics, right? Uh, um, and I, I do know that the companies are looking at investing in other regions of the world, right? Uh, and, and therefore, if it is, uh, they are looking at developing South America again, for the supply for for cocoa, um, they need to find solutions for cadmium. That's that's definitely you know. So 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 that's um, yeah. At least from the industry side, it's top priority. You know. So I I I, I hope I was able to answer the question. Yeah, yeah, it was it was good. Uh, this is very interesting, David, because um, you know sometimes we mainly here in Brazil we have. Uh, loads of uh, resources and um, I think so uh, in most of the time we don't have enough people to do everything that we need to do. <laughs> yeah. So, well, I, I, yeah well I know that Brazil is, is becoming now I mean it's already a, a major supplier of, of food to the world right so, and you know there's a lot of potential for expanding that even more you know so th that is how I think for Brazil this is uh, huge potential you know really there's a lot of potential here 
Yeah, it is very interesting because like big uh big farms or farmers they exactly export the commodities and everything so they they have one um they need one kind of uh one one style of research and that sometimes people that put the food in our table here in brazil is small farmers so the needs is totally different from one one big one big guy to a small one and I think yeah. it's the same thing when you move around looking for the cocoa producers. So you get really small guys, small farms in some places and a little bigger in other areas. So the needs and the way that we need to, to uh, support them is totally different. So right. when you think about any kind of, always when I think about any uh, about any type right, of, um, of crop, I say, always I think you have low very low amount of people searching about it you know? so oh, that is a really big team okay but when you look the details we need more people to get into isn't it because yeah. like you, you 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 spend your journey so it's, you have the data that you got the kind of information that you have so it's take very long isn't yeah it? yeah i mean so, so, science is hard right uh, i mean yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, 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 <laughs> It's a lot of effort. It's a lot of hard work. Uh, I think as uh, as researchers, uh, I mean we uh, we get very little benefits, uh, you know, really. Uh, but uh, as uh, as researchers, uh, I mean we do it. A lot of researchers do it because this is their passion, right? Yes. Uh, th th this yes. is what we love doing, you know. And uh, and we yeah, so we, we don't, yeah, yeah, we don't do it for 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 money to become famous. <laughs> Yeah, we don't. We, we barely make much. You know, if it is you, you want to become rich. Probably not science is not not really to go into. You know, but uh, <laughs> but uh, but the the pleasure of uh, I, I think what defines a scientist uh, is a person who is always seeking truth. You know, to seeking knowledge to better understand the world, the world around him or her, um, and, and that's. That really is what a, a scientist is a is a curious person is a person who who is always hungry for knowledge or always asking why try to to better understand really that's that that's the drive you know and you know and and, and at the end of the day I, I would always tell myself if it is I could make just a tiny contribution to 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 science uh, to my community uh, to my fellow uh, cocoa scientists and breeders. Uh, and, and 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 to humanity i'm i'm happy with that really you know i'm, I'm yeah. quite happy with that you know last year when, when i went to north behind we have a, a a quick conversation yeah this year when i went to north behind last may again but it was very quickly because i went to a conference in edinburgh and th this conversation now made, it reminds me professor uh graham walker Exactly in the big conference, a lot of industries and all the guys there. And Walker is is he's getting to to uh, close to to retire. So he said, guys, in his speech, he said, guys, I'm not I'm not here to make money. So I I'm here to get some fun. <laughs> so <laughs> it's exactly what we're looking for, isn't it? Because uh, uh, research is like it's hard. But we, we always think that we have fun some way. So yeah, yeah. I think that also there's a very few jobs uh, that allows you to be to be almost childlike, uh, you know, because when it is your approach problems, uh, you have to be very naive uh, and ask the most outrageous questions. You almost like a child. You know, and 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 be as creative uh, as you can, because who knows what might be uh, the the solution. You know, and you know, there's very few jobs I think that uh, encourages you uh, to be like that. So, and and science is one of them. We have one more question. Is uh, I think a few more. Uh, John Silva, he asked, is uh, bioremediation or even specific plants to remove cadmium from the soil, if it's one the knee measures measures to mitigate the amount of available from cocoa trees, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. So um, by remediation, yes, sir. Um, uh, using um, uh, hyper accumulators, uh, so so uh, we've seen that. So there are, so for instance, you you plant uh, other types of trees uh, uh, together with your crop, uh, and they they absorb the capium from the soil, means less capium for your plant, right? Um, yep. So that's that's one of the the possibilities uh, also uh, being explored. Um, although it's, I, I haven't gotten, I haven't seen much traction out of that uh, from the community, you know, so most of the work has been really focused on the, the, the additives uh, to the soil. A lot of work has been put into, in, in that direction, but, uh, but yeah, of, of, of course, uh, bioremediation, uh, potential, uh, solution. And, and in fact, it's, at least uh, for now, it could be a combination of uh, of measures. Uh, you know, so you don't have to just use one, but you could use uh, different uh, measures, uh, uh, and then uh, to help you uh, mitigate the the cadmium risk. Even uh, though uh, this this question, uh, I think we were already. Uh, Answer that question, yes. So, one more question from Ron Silva. Yeah, what what's the uh, advance being made in research in terms of genetic improvement and whether this improvement by uh, improved varieties will reach small cocoa producers? Yeah, so I, I I wonder if uh, um, he is a a cocoa breeder or, or a, a a cocoa farmer because uh, that's a very good point that he's making. Um, so yeah, in the past 10, 20 years, especially with um, um, the the advances in genetics. So, um, there's a lot of a lot of research being done to develop markers to um, to develop uh, um, like getting markers for for cocoa for breeding. Uh, the industry generally has been staying away from um, creating GMOs, right? So just because the uh, especially because uh, uh, the Europeans are not very fond of it, and Europe it, it's it's a major market. So so the industry farmers countries on the whole has been staying away from uh, going in that direction. Uh, traditional breeding, fine, right? Uh, at least, you know, so, um, and, and so a lot of work has been done in trying to identify um, markers. So you look at the literature, uh, markers for resistance, markers for productivity. Uh, yeah, uh, but how many of these markers are actually being used by breeders? I think very little, if any. And I, I think the reason for this uh, is that uh, a lot of the research done so far by the community, I mean, so my fellow chocolate scientists, uh, you know, is uh, um, we get to the point of uh, identifying candidates. So we identify a candidate marker. Okay, cool. So what next? You know, just because you have uh, candidate markers doesn't mean that these markers are really good. You know, how uh, are they reliable markers? So how much of an effect do they have in 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 producing and linking to the trait? Uh, um, you know, so I think uh, a lot of a lot of research goes into identifying candidate markers, but very little effort has been gone into validating markers. And I think that's really where the gap is. You know, it's uh, and and validating markers is additional work. I mean, I, yeah, I, 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 this is what we're doing, and it's additional work. But uh, in order for for us to have, uh, it, it shouldn't be that we we're just doing the research just to get papers. 
uh, we have markers. Okay, we found potential markers. We get a publication out of it. But rather, we, we identify these mark we, potential markers. We validate. We actually show that it's controlling the trait, uh, and think, and then it can be used by the breeders. So, you know, and I think that that is why breeders have been a bit hesitant uh, in 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 using any of these markers. You know, so uh, I mean th that that's that's my personal opinion. Um, is that uh, as a community, you know, I think we need to step up our game. Uh, that that that's simply. I, I think we need to the science we need to do. We need to go the extra effort. So we need to show uh, how these markers can be used. Uh, they are they are reliable um, and actually um, can do what this we say they can do. And that way, the breeders uh, can now start implementing them and start developing and varieties. Uh, and and it's it's this is not going to happen overnight though uh, it's a uh, cocoa it's it's a difficult crop uh, you know mainly because it takes three years uh, to go uh, to go through a generation at least three years uh, and there's a lot of work uh, involved uh, um but uh, hopefully uh, at least i i have uh, uh, I, I mean I, i'm positive that uh, the community would understand this importance uh, you know, there's a new generation of, uh, I'm seeing a new generation of cocoa scientists, uh, really. And uh, they're using the latest in technologies and, and they're really pushing the boundaries. And I, 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 I do believe uh, that we would push the deal in the right direction. And we would eventually bring about the changes uh, for the average small cocoa producer would start seeing the benefits. Uh, you know, I, I, I really believe that's going to happen. In the future, very nicely. Uh, I ha I have a, 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 a few questions. Like, uh, for example, uh, let's start from the beginning. <laughs> what type What type of microorganism have you identified in cocoa? All the varieties of cocoa have have you tried? Have you analyzed? What type of microorganisms have you found them? Because in my knowledge, I know that there are a lot of yeasts and bacteria there. But maybe the, the microbiota is more complex than this. So <laughs> what do you have yeah. found there in, in that? Yeah. So I mean, so, so that's the, the other side, uh, the other half of me that uh, 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 with, with, with the chocolates, uh, right? It's, it's looking at the fermentation. So I mean, so there are different strains. Uh, so, so I'm speaking about, the, in particular, the fermentation. Uh, different strains of yeast uh, uh, we identify, different strains of, uh, of other uh, bacteria. Uh, there is usually you see a uh, very uh, uh, dominance of Acetobacter. Uh, uh, also, you could find some Lactobacillus. Uh, there's also like the uh, different types of Enterobacter and a range of different uh, microbes. Uh. Uh, that occur during the fermentation. So, and uh, we've been looking at how it is uh, these microbes uh, as a community might be shaping the flavors that you get. You know? So the, the current belief uh, is that you get different flavors because of the, the, the different varieties. Right? So different varieties gives you different flavors uh, of cocoa. But while that might be true in some cases, uh, it, it cannot explain everything that we see. Because for instance, you take uh, the same variety, you grow it in different locations, you ferment, you get your beans, you get different flavor profiles, you know? right? So so, it's, so while there might be a genetic effect, the varieties contribute to the flavors, uh, you do get an environmental effect. Uh, and uh, uh, what's in the environment, of course, so, so the French call it terroir, right? So the, the environment, uh, everything around from the, the the, the air, the soil, the nutrients in the soil, too, everything else. So, uh, and 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 that that's essentially what we've been looking at is the environmental effect, mainly how it is these microbes from the environment, and uh, we've been looking at how the environments from the farm, the the the, the microbes from the farms, uh, actually get to the beans, uh, and how these microbes uh, develop. Uh, uh, and shape the flavor profile for specific locations. Uh, you know, so we, we've identified um, uh, several thousand microbes, uh, um, and, and we've been trying to uh, piece together this uh, this riddle 
you know, how it is they might be controlling this. Um, as, and, and, but most of this has been centered around fermentations uh, and flavors. Uh, of course, there's the, the other angle of, so what are the microbes uh, uh, outside as a whole, like in the plant, uh, you know? So, so that's another interesting question. Unfortunately, we haven't done uh, much work on that, but also very, very fascinating stuff as well. Yeah, this is one, uh, for example, um, I, you know, I, I work with uh, doing, you study fermentation, different type of yeast in alcoholic fermentation. So exactly, different strains you give different uh, uh, flavor profiles. So I'm having, in last year, I found a very nice paper talking about uh, 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 cocoa fermentation. It says exactly, you have a, uh, Alcoholic fermentation in in as in acetic fermentation later, isn't it? So first, the fermentation by yeast after bacteria. So this guy he used the he, he used the uh, a product to uh, to kill all the yeast present in the cocoa, and exactly no no flavors were were generated there. <laughs> so the main player is exactly the yeast, isn't it? So after yeah. that, they have a second fermentation that gives uh, maybe increase the kind of reaction because, uh, like like you know, in, in the, the in Central America, people the, the guys produce a lot of room, and the room there is produced by exactly using uh, yeast and bacteria because give a different kind of flavor, a different. Uh, um, viscosity and all the things different for, for the, the room quality. So this was the, uh, the same question that uh, reminded me again of Professor Walker, because I presented a kind of work that we have been conducting here. We produce a uh, sugarcane spirit, that uh, Brazilian sugarcane spirit, from 11 different uh, sugarcane varieties, oh, one nice. by one. Yeah. And we got a totally different uh, uh, product by the end, and and you know this eleven varieties were the same from the same environment, same soil, same environment, and we got different amount of yeast from each kind of sugarcane juice. So it's it's amazing how the crops they respond different when right? have the total the, the the genetic composition are different, isn't it? They are physiologically different. So. Yeah. We got totally different products by the end. We are finished exactly to evaluate the the, the, the flavor profile. The guys in, in in Edinburgh they got quite quite excited about our data because a very simple thing that we did. So it took a lot of time and a lot of work. I said to my guys, oh, uh, uh, guys, I said that this was was a simple work, but was not <laughs> was hard work. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> But this, this is this is, is really amazing. Like we, exactly the kind of microbiota that we got, and sometimes like uh, if you have a low amount of uh, is not uh, water uh, availability in that environment, that same variety can change totally the, the kind of microorganism that will be available, or simply reduce the amount of microorganisms in in, in, the, in their biota. So it's, it's incredible, mate. They have a look at all the all the different crops, different environments. We have loads of things to do. Is that yeah. why I said I always I think it's too is really really a few people doing research in the entire yeah. world when you think the kind of amount of things that we, we should look look at, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean that 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 that, that is true. It's, it's quite amazing, you know, that how how complex uh, it can be you know you have uh, lots of factors that coming into play that can uh, and especially like with, with microbes and shaping these communities uh, you know and and, and the, the changes that they can bring about so uh. I've, I've noticed david you just came to my next question it's like um you notice that uh, different uh, mineral uh, mineral elements profile or different cocoa is it gives always uh, also Difference in the the uh, the cocoa flavors, the the the, uh, the fermentation flavors. Yeah. Um, so we we've we've kind of looked at that a bit, uh, 
Um, but uh, it's I, I I haven't I can't say conclusively. Yeah, you know it's uh, so we 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 looked at um we did ICPMS uh, so we looked at the elemental profiles we did LCMS uh, looked at the so look at the non volatiles with the LCMS we did GCMS looked at the volatiles uh, um and we do see uh we were able to we could make links between uh the the non volatiles uh, with the GCMS data and flavors. Uh, and also we can um, detect this at also the, the volatile level, right? So with the GCMS. Uh, I, I tell so, you this. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. Because I, I exactly, I published two, two papers on my, my thesis already. That exactly, uh, the first one we play exactly in, in uh, eight uh, minerals. And when we, when we looked at um, phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, they tend to increase the, 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 the flavors. So when you depends on the amount of the, the heavy metals, copper, zinc, manganese, and iron, they tend to reduce the flavor because they, they have a, a high level, they tend to kill the, the, the microorganisms, they kill the yeast. Right. Uh, so after this, we, uh, we published this, this paper in the Food Chemistry Journal, and the second one, the food, the food, uh, the, uh, food research international, because the, the 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 final one we played exactly. I create a synthetic word that we could we could exclude or include anything that we want, and we did experimental design playing with fossil potassium magnesium to see how they interact in response of the flavors. So this is what a really interesting data that we got by the end. So maybe something that you should look at like. I, How this, yeah, this, I, main, this main minerals have any connection, the concentration of them, the connection of the, 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 the flavor profile. Yeah, Maybe I mean, it's... In the main player that we found was exactly the magnesium. This was really interesting. Okay, I I, 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 will, I will check out that, that work that you did. And um, yeah, I'll take a, a second look at the um, the, the uh, ICPMS data uh, and see if it is I could uh, see any sort of connections uh, uh, with particular flavors that might uh, that, that that might exist inside there, yeah. but but yeah. but thanks for thanks for that. Yeah. Good. Um, we have a question from uh, Valdivia. I, I, I will translate. Uh, he asked about the if let's see areas. Mm -hmm. All the areas worldwide that produce uh, uh, cocoa, cocoa, they. They have significant level of cadmium uh, on the ground in, in the ground. Right. So he's asking if uh, if all the regions do they have significant levels of cadmium? Yes. For example, in South America, you say that the in South Africa they don't have too much problem with cadmium. But when yeah. you think about South America and Central America generally, the is coming higher. So it's exactly yeah. because of the cadmium content in the soil is too high in this area and you have oh, any clue or why well uh, yeah so like uh, compared to to west africa the levels in um in south america elevated right uh, i mean so because there are some countries I don't wanna, that, that would have extremely high levels of cadmium, but uh, but so I, I would say South America is it's elevated, right? It's elevated enough uh, that uh, um, the beans and the, the trees would absorb the cadmium, and the levels in the beans are maybe a, a, a bit of uh, above the the cutoff point uh, the EU would have set. Um, so wh why do we have uh, um, these these levels in in South America? Uh, it's it's likely due to to the um, uh, due to uh, volcanic soil, right? So volcanoes uh, in in the region, um, uh, and 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 that's what you get from the volcanoes it deposits uh, levels of cadmium being uh, from from that, uh, you know. So and so that's likely the main source. Uh, I mean, there's. Yeah, and also if the the soil is a bit acidic, yeah, it's it's a little more uh, mobile, right? So 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 that that's the other uh, 
uh, possibility as well, you know, that, that could resulting in the elevated levels of the cadmium in, in the cocoa from the region. Nice. Um, I think we have a question from Savio, Savio Sayani. Um, he asked if, uh, if there is any positive um, uh, and positive thing about cadmium, uh, consider the uh, ecosystem that the, the cocoa is cultivated. Any any positive uh... any any positive correlation with cadmium in the ox uh, 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 ecosystem that the cocoa is cultivated? There is any positive thing about cadmium in the soil or in the environment? Yeah, there is zero positive anything about cadmium really. You know, uh, it's not needed by plants. Uh, um, it's not needed by us. Uh, um, and when it's it, it, the levels are too high in plants or us, uh, um, leads to a lot of bad things. Uh, so, yeah, it's 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 one of those elements we we really don't need. You know, we could do without. Uh. Good. Uh, the next one is Halini Dantas. She asked, oh. What the challenges that we we face to control cadmium, and how it can it can affect these small rural communities? So, what are the challenges we face? The in challenges to control to the to control cadmium. What the challenge? Right. So, could be something related to uh, bioremediation, or exactly what you do specific kind of, uh, uh, understand the genes and developing new, yeah. new varieties. What what the, yeah. the real challenge and how can it affect small producers? Yeah, it's, uh, so I, I think the, the, the challenge right now for that uh, the producers are facing, it's, uh, um, it's, it's very, it's very, so there are the, the methods that we do have for controlling cadmium, um, it's very time consuming, it's very expensive, it's not sustainable. Uh, you have to look at also the, the other, other side is the most of the farmers are, are very small farmers, right? These, these guys are, I mean, unfortunately, they're, they're barely making enough to get by from year to year. Now you're, you're adding on top of that another another hurdle for them to cross uh, and for them uh, it might be too much uh, because uh, 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 because now it's they have to invest uh time money uh into trying to reduce uh, this cadmium you, you're telling them you're telling the farmer about something called cadmium he has no idea what this thing is right uh, he is uh, he's really what what are these guys now telling me about this cadmium you know so so it's it's a combination of uh, now we have to also part of it is education you know so uh, educating uh, farmers becoming let them become more aware of it uh. um, so we did see we, we do know that some fertilizers uh, uh, use uh, also has cadmium in it uh, so it's uh, like governments have been now uh, testing fertilizers and developing policies to kind of regulate. Uh, and advising farmers which fertilizers uh, they can use and which ones not to use. Uh, so there's also that challenge at, at that level, at government level. Uh, governments, uh, I think for when it is the EU did, uh, so even though the the community aware of the, the cadmium issue, when the EU did implement the policies, uh, it sort of uh, encouraged the the, the 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 industry to to actually act and do something you know so it's a, it's a, uh, the challenge too was getting governments to to understand the problem and then start developing policies uh, um, uh, in place to to reduce the risk from environmental pollution from industries uh, uh, reduce pollution from from other sources uh, using uh, fertilizers with reduced cadmium um, 
start and educating farmers so it's 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 not just finances but it's also a lot of social uh challenges as well it's 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 because it's it's because it's, it's it's one of those things you know it's politics society uh, finances and it's, it's all combined uh, together of course and if you if we we talk about these things uh, we start to explain a little bit of science uh, in different uh, developing countries to be easy some to 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 make this happen so when you come to uh, uh, countries that countries that are not well developed so this because this is totally related to education so it's get very difficult to make people understand and live the way that you used to do things to do <laughs> new things in the correct yeah. way so it's yeah. a really tough yeah. it's a really tough work yeah, I mean, if, if a farmer has been producing his cocoa a particular way for years, it's kind of hard, you know, to try to explain to him, oh, no, we, we need to do it differently. You know? So it's, it's a, these are also some of the challenges that the industry has been facing. Like, like it's happened to me in the small sugarcane spirit production, the guy, he, <laughs> the owner, he, he, raise a guy that have been doing um, producing sugarcane for working for sugarcane producers for about 25 years so when I got there to to support to help them and he say I have been doing this about 25 years I I, I my my thought he give me a lot of work here because <laughs> he already has his way to do that's not the correct way to do things so it was really difficult to make him understand and change yeah. the way that he used to do things to get a, a, to get the correct way to do it get good flavors because he he was just looking at oh is the the spirit is translucent so it's good <laughs> <laughs> so, and we, did, we did a lot of uh tests and analysis and say no it's not good <laughs> it is not yeah. horrible so that's yeah. it so, yeah. so I mean, that Oh, this young guy just talk too much, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, so that that's also part of the job. I mean, as yeah, as, as, as as researchers, you know, we face that as well. You know, it's trying to communicate as best as we could our ideas uh, to to the public. You know, it's uh, and we can we can put put this as one big challenge for the acad academia because sometimes we communicate very well indoors. <laughs> But outdoor is not is, we cannot get it, you know. So yeah. exactly why I, I always I say like um, uh, things that have been happening lately, like a three minutes thesis, um, part of science is very interesting thing to make we approach to get closer to the community and they ask the question that they want to ask because sometimes <laughs> we just we ask our questions and not leave them to, let them to yeah. ask the, the proper question. So, like you said, listening and sometimes getting back and say, "Oh, I, I needed to look at this and think like as a, a, a child, because it's important yeah. to to get the, the 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 needs of the the different communities and different areas. And maybe when you work in different um, part of the of the world, so each area have a different uh, necessity. So it's quite difficult, isn't it?" It's adaptation yeah, yeah. all the time. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 it's, it's something that uh, you know it's it's important because we we're, we're doing all this exciting work, uh, but if um if it is we can't communicate it to to the public uh, to understand uh, uh how it's important and how it is uh, uh these discoveries can help improve their lives. You know, it then it's almost to waste, right? Uh, so, and 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 that's it. You know, it's. Uh, Part of the job too is is trying to develop the skills to do that, uh, to become better communicators. Yeah. Uh, David, I think you know we can spend the entire day talking. You'll be <laughs> always amazing, and we talk about science is very exciting. However, I th I think is we get to the end now, and I would like to 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 make your final consideration, and uh, maybe you can sp you can say. Uh, anything about your journey and what what kind of, of message you would like to 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 deliver to new 
new young guys that are doing post graduation now they uh, uh, that can make them uh, more passionate and think that science is hard but it's is is lovely <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah, okay. So, so, so I, I didn't get the last part, but I, I think it's you're asking like my general thoughts on, on sort of like uh, the encouragement for the, the next generation. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, so I, I mean, so how I, how I got into science is essentially so. First, when I left high school, I, I would at a regular job, you know, and um, it was very uh, monotonous, just uh very repetitive, uh, doing the same thing over and over. It was quite boring. And then, you know, he, I did try different other jobs uh, uh, afterwards. Uh, uh, got into music a bit. Uh, uh, but then afterwards, I I, I, I got into to science. Mainly, I focused, I gravitated towards biochemistry, genetics. That was really, really my thing. Uh, and it just opened up a world that I never... I mean, so I'm from I'm from Trinidad. You know, it's it's a tiny island in the middle in, in the Caribbean. You know, I I, I come from a, a fairly small town. You know, on the map, it's not really much. Yeah? But when I I got into science, uh, it opened up opportunities that I would have never had ever. Like period. You know, it it has allowed me to travel to parts of the world that I've never, you know, I've, I've never dreamt uh, that I would have traveling and, and, and visiting before. I've met people from, from countless countries, uh, people that, I, you know, I, I never would have expected to. I've made friends uh, spanning the globe, uh, building collaborations, uh, working, I'm wo working on projects, uh, some uh, really awesome, exciting. We're working on projects because it's just so interesting, and and then it's so it's so challenging too. It's 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 uh, it's it really is. Uh, I would I would since I've got into science, I've never had a, a boring day, like, ever. You know, I've had very stressful days. Uh, you know, so imagine your your uh, your researchers. You you go to the lab. You're working on your 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 stuff. Uh, um, most of the time it doesn't work out, right? So you come up with ideas, and you're like, oh yeah, I think this idea is gonna work. Most of the time it doesn't, uh, you know, it's like, <laughs> so, um, uh, but that's, that's, that's what it is, you know? Uh, science is about, uh, I think it's, uh, you know, uh, being persistent. It's, it's a lot of hard work. Uh, you, you test your ideas and if your ideas are sound, I mean, it, It'll, it'll stand up, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm always open for discussion. So I like to talk about what I do to almost everyone because I'm, you never know, you know, I might have one way of seeing the problem, but I've, someone else, their perspective on seeing it might be quite different and actually might be quite insightful, you know. So so that is why I, I, I talk about what I do all the time to anyone. Anyone, literally anyone, and uh, people are always quite excited about it too. So I'm, I'm happy about that. Uh, you know, uh, they, but yeah. they, this make this make me uh, remind me about you know that pub in the Super Burlington Village that we, <laughs> we went there once. So you went there once. I used to go there once a week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I made yeah, a yeah. lot of friends in there, and you know, there is a uh, one part. I think this the fourth. Uh, uh, yeah, the fourth chapter of my thesis. Uh, I spent the day work a, a month, and I did some fermentation that I spent forty eight hours without sleeping, just following it. So when I got the data to my 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 cost supervisor, he said, "This is not you. You can put it out from your thesis." I said, what? No, 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 no. you be my thesis. He said. No matter because this we can use for give some lectures or something, but it's not new data. I said, no, 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 you being my thesis. I spent 48 hours not, not sleeping and mm -hmm. uh, two weeks running things in GC, in uh, HPLC, uh, ICPMS. You being my thesis. And he said, okay, find a way to explain this in a uh, novel way or You'll be out. So yeah. I got uh, out from there. I said, oh, my God, what, what can I do? So my brain was 
I'm very tired. He said he went to the pub. I have a few talks there. Talk to the old old guys from that they used to work for a lot of big companies. So in the moment, say, oh yes, the idea came. Well, no, we had a, a, a we had a conversation about some some uh, production spirit in Scotland, but you know, but out of the blue, the idea came. <laughs> yeah. I got home, make some notes. <laughs> Next day, I have a look say, oh, it's good. <laughs> and the idea yeah. came. So it's exactly, we should just keep talking to people. Yeah. And um, so sometimes, you know, the guys, some people find, oh, I don't want to talk too much about my research because someone can, can try to stall it. So it doesn't make any sense for me because the way that I think is totally different the way that you think. So right. if I have the yeah. same expertise and we read the same paper, we got different a point of view about the same thing so you need to yeah. share talk and yeah. make things happen so exactly how it works yeah i, I mean I, I i think that's really the, the culture at least that that's one of i think i would call that an, a strong point uh, is that uh, being open like this uh, has helped me uh develop uh, a lot uh, a, a lot of skills develop uh, how it is i think uh, and and see pro- Problems and, and help me shape projects, you know. So and it's it's definitely I would say you know I would encourage all all the young researchers, you know, that, that be as open as you can, you know. Uh, um, talk about uh, what you do, um, and it helps you better under. Actually, just talking about helps you understand it better for yourself because if it is you're trying to explain it to a non-scientist, uh, you need to be able to explain it to the point where they'll be able to understand this without having that background knowledge, right? So it helps you, it helps your communication skills. So, uh, and, and just to also add to this, you know, um, I, I would also, if it is you have opportunities to experience uh, uh, the world, experience science beyond the, uh, beyond your university, beyond your, your, your town, your country, and, and go out and visit other places, you would, you would, it would, it would make you mature uh, and, and I guess increase your experiences uh, because it's going to help you develop a lot more as a researcher because now you start seeing how other people do things and how it is you can improve. Uh, you know, so I would say try to take these advantages, take these opportunities when they, 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 they do arise, you know, because it would help you as a researcher become much, much better. You know, and I do see like... Uh, so like a lot of the research, the research power right now, it's centered. It's been a lot with with Europe uh, and with the US, uh, you know. But I do see our region. Uh, I see our Caribbean, and South America. I see the scientists in our region becoming uh, pioneers in also research and also leading uh, the community. You know, at least th- th- that's uh, uh, that's my vision. Is that uh, you know we could also become powerhouses. Uh, in, in driving uh, science uh, as uh, as a whole, you know, so so that that's just a, a few thoughts I have. Yeah, no, this, this always is very nice to to to, to, to talk to you, David. It's, a, it's always amazing. You no, know, uh, first at the beginning when we met, always we had a really nice conversation the, in the pub, in the gym, uh, on the street. <laughs> and it's always yeah. a really good time for a good chat, isn't it? Yeah. So. Guys, um, thank you very much for everyone. Thank you, David, for your very, very, very exciting uh, uh, presentation. It was a very good, good talk. Um, I see that the audience got very excited as well because people make questions in English, in Portuguese, and uh, we, we did our best to, to translate and uh, um, uh, make, make uh, this, this conversation work. So this was David. A little bit of idea was what what is unlocking cocoa uh, genetic potential for reducing uh, reducing cadmium in chocolate. So when talk about chocolate, it's always exciting, isn't it, you guys? So thank you very much. Thanks, David. Bye bye, pessoal. Ciao ciao. Okay. Bye, guys. Segura um pouco, David. <laughs>